Donna Doe is a multimedia digital conceptual artist based in New Orleans. Her work incorporates immersive digital environments as well as 2D imaging and sculpture. Dado has been shown at the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York, the Armand and Hammer Museum in LA, the New Orleans Museum of Art and the Aldrich Museum of Contemporary Art in Connecticut. She's acknowledged in two current college textbooks, Understanding Art and Postmodern Currents. Also experienced as a writer and publisher, Dado is the founding editor-in-chief of, uh, of the award-winning Arts Quarterly for the New Orleans Museum of Art and has written numerous articles, including on the death of New Orleans for Art in America. Dado is among the eight original founders of the New Orleans Contemporary Arts Center. Another interesting item of note, Don is the winner of the 1976 Demolition Derby, staged in the Superdome. She was the sole female contestant. Well, thanks for coming out. All 20 of them. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> okay. Uh, my talk is titled Reflections on Turbulence, the Affect of Disaster, and it will take you through kind of my own mind spin of uh, the history of disasters and then my own encounter with the personal disaster uh, and then how that all unravels. Okay, so if we can dim the lights. Charles, that's an amazing guy, Charles. I'm going to kidnap him. <laughs> so, Charles, I'm going to do a test before we get started. There we go. Okay. We're going to go back to the origins of art making and the origins of disaster and loss, which I think are synonymous. And you go into the, to the, the cave, into our burial sites, and they, they say that what separates mankind from other species is our, uh, our burying of our dead. They always say that. I think it's really that we had hands and that if my dog could bury me, he would. <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so I think there is something related to uh, our hands and our physiology and our burying of the dead. And I don't think that connection's uh, discussed enough, but uh, anyway, we'll try to do a little of that here, or we'll leave it to other disciplines. Um, so I'm thinking that the impulse to bury our dead and the impulse to make art, which is to memorialize our dead and to try to encapsulate memory, uh, are both kind of starting in prehistoric times. Our sense of loss and our profound sense of love, and that somewhere between love and loss is the fabric of art. And in making art, whether it's to express these highs of love and of appreciation for this bountiful experience of living, uh, whether it's that or whether it's our last gesture to leave something behind, we have a history of making a mark, of leaving our mark. And uh, I think that we'll, we'll see that when I depress you further tonight and take you through one disaster after the next. We'll talk about this gesture to communicate and to leave a mark and to try to put an imprint on the memory of our heirs. So this um, is a little bit out of sync, but I had the cave painting. And uh, then this is a picture of someone's refrigerator uh, during Katrina, and the images are kind of fading, but that refrigerator art <laughs> is tender too. So how we bury the caves, 
and I'm putting this kind of between the alpha and the omega, the arc, our marks, our music, and then again back to this thing I kept going to, just love and loss. Um, and when we talk about reflections on turbulence and disasters, that's a big collective thing that we'll get into. But just a singular loss of anyone's life, anyone's, is a painful, uh, a painful experience and something, just one life, we wish to uh, memorialize. So just ordinary death is enough to make you scream. Little cliche, but had to throw it in. All right, Pompeii, we have in history these kind of sweeping episodes of disaster. These are beautiful. I mean, the form of, how gorgeous is that? The first one is like the thinker. Um, so anyway, this, this of course would be something that we would consider a large sweeping disaster. We've got tsunamis now, but of course historically there are, there are things such as tsunamis that are part of the Japanese mythology and the mythology throughout Asia. We've dealt with historically things such as the plague. And what I'm going to do here is talk about how, how these big disasters um, impact art making and culture. So the play, of course, changed the, the fervor of our religious, you know, our religious uh, quest and also impacted the art. It changed the, um, the type of art, got very dark, of course. So these are some great medieval pieces. We've got an earthquake in San Francisco. We've got AIDS. Keith Haring, of course, the, the whole thing, both personally and part of his community, what was happening in the United States, he, he dealt with this, I think, um, in the collective and also in the personal. I just love this image, and I was not familiar with it until I decided to acknowledge Keith Haring, and I, I just think it's a pretty powerful image. And of course, through all of these things, these episodes, it is our impulse, whether we're artists or people sitting on a city council board, we want to memorialize. And we turn to art to memorialize. Now there's public art we can talk about, we should, uh, or I should point out, of course, the distinctions between public art and, um, and personal art. All right, Chernobyl. By the way, I'm, I'm putting all of this in our head because what happened in, with Katrina and what happened with the oil spill and what has happened to Louisiana is just a blip on the radar. It's just a blip on the radar. It's bad, but it's normal. It's normal. Disasters happen. It's kind of episodic. The difference between the loss of a, of, of a singular loved one and these kind of calamities is, of course, yes, we grieve, but our society, all the things that you would turn to in a time of crisis, that too is collapsed. So it gets kind of Foucaultian kind of madness and civilization. There's this breakdown. And the fear increases, the xenophobia increases, and hopelessness uh, can strike. So again, this is just putting Katrina in perspective. A bunch of earthquakes in Haiti. Then there's the politics, right? The politics. This is a, a gripping, I, I know it's, it's somewhat macabre, it just grabbed me, this bicycle run over by a tank. It's, it's really, Pretty heavy. Now, I kept trying to check to see if this was a real photo or doctored, and it looks like it's real. But they, does anybody know the story of this image? It's not real. It, it's, not real. It, it's not? Okay, so what? Good. Okay, let's get that. <clears throat> but it's still significant. Huh? It's still significant. 
It's, uh, uh, then, uh, sorry, never mind. It's, it's, no, it's, I want to hear. It's a small group. We might as well have a conversation. Well, it, I think it's still significant in that, what? It's using art. Right. Using art to, you know. Oh, okay. So, yeah, that somebody kind of. Yeah. Yeah. And there comes a point that we can then begin to look at even the most horrific events with this lighter touch. Because he, that figure, uh, was taken by many people and made into a, a where's wall of figure, where you found him sit, uh, you know, at many different historic occasions. You could sign the, the same figure, the same representation uh, of the face, etc. And so, in other words, despite how bad everything gets, we carry on. Thank you. Please, I do want this to be a conversation. Uh, so if you have anything to say, please raise your hand and let's, um, let's consider this dialogue. So maybe Katrina. Am I going backwards? OK. Then we have another tsunami. <laughs> These images are so bad. Here's again the tsunami. This is the way that in a big piece that has been touring um, around the world, uh, photographs that were recovered uh, after the tsunami and that are somewhat faded and they couldn't figure out who to return these photographs to. But they didn't want to destroy them because it was the residue of so much of, of former lives. So this is, again, you know, you have these uh, atrocious uh, episodes, these events, but we have, the, there's the immediate impulse to memorialize. Of course, we've got this going up for 9-11. Then I go back to my thinker. That image, by the way, one of them has the proper photo credit. Uh, that was uh, a National Geographic, and I did call and ask if I could use it in the, but this is from National Geographic. Um, so I talk about you have these kind of breakdowns in the social structure and, and fear and xenophobia just, it runs amok. And so after the, you know, during the first um, plague, I think it was in the late 13, 13 something, and it started in Italy, in Siena. So the, there's the plague outbreak, but then they're going to blame it on the Jews and the gypsies. So then there's this, this killing. There's um, chaos with Katrina. And then one of the bad side effects in New Orleans, we've got the Danger Bridge. And you've got fear arises. And uh, this is uh, just a terrible, terrible side effect. I think with, um, with war, there is an enemy. You know, you've got, oh, you did something, you're the bad guy, and I'm the victim, I'm the good person, I have been wronged, and I'm going to make it right. But with natural disasters and disease, it's, it's a different thing, like who is the enemy? And so you invent some enemies sometimes just because you just don't know what to do. Um, then there's, I'm going to get into superstitions and what not later, and of course, if you have disasters like this, there's a rise in religi uh, religious uh, practice, in superstitions, lucky charms, uh, and then that runs against uh, superstitions and religions, of course, go into conflict uh, repeatedly. So um, I just wanted to remind us that we had our little deal here. And uh, this is Wounded Knee, of course, another injustice. Going into World War I, which greatly impact art as we know it today, of course. Um, I turn often when I think of that time period to Otto Dix. I think he's just an amazing artist. And, um, so a lot of art coming out of pre and post World War One. This kind of nihilism, that nihilistic, um, sense which informed Dadaism and then ran into surrealism, the sense that uh, nothing really matters and uh, a new look at how we think of objects and materialism. 
and possessions. So just getting into this, um, this particular period of time, of course, with World War I, the lost generation, the Dadaist, uh, the rise of existentialism. So we get to that point in history, and all of a sudden, it's so uh, enormous. The, the, the scope of this is so enormous that um, it actually blows faith out of the water, and there is this um, new existential movement that takes hold, and I think um, throughout postmodern philosophical currents, um, we're still, I think, um, bouncing back and forth with existentialism as, as, as a corner post. Spanish Civil War. Max Ernst, who will prove to be important when I start speaking of New Orleans. This is the London Blitz, Berlin. Are you depressed yet? Am I depressed yet? Okay. Um, So, of course, getting into abstract expressionism, which is post-war, but I think that if you look at early Pollock, which that is one, he was very influenced by Max Ernst and the experiences of Max Ernst through the war and how he depicted it. And I think Pollock, in his transition before becoming a full uh, abstractionist. Um, he, he did have some figurative work. Which... So then we have uh, Paula just letting it go in a very full abstraction here. This is some art that resulted from Tiananmen Square. Famous uh, Chinese artist in June. Chinese artists depicting this of the Nanjing Massacre. I'm going to talk about it. Uh, this is more from the German. That's a little out of order, I apologize. This artist, um, Anselm Keeper, I just think is so powerful. And unlike his teacher, Joseph Boyce, Anselm Kiefer, I think, really dealt with the, the crime of the war and the, and the guilt and the remorse. And I think uh, Joseph Boyce has given a lot of credit for where we are now. But uh, I think he was, uh, well, anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm critical of a lot of his biography and some smoke and mirrors. And I don't think Boyce ever really owned it. You know, he, he flew uh, six missions in World War II, six. And he really just didn't deal with it. But this guy did. This guy did. I thought it was interesting that Anselm Kiefer, when he was first starting out, he did, a, he picked up the tradition a bit of the German um, expressionist with the, with the dominance of the woodcut. Of course, that was, uh, not a medium that this particular artist in the late 20th century had to turn to because replication now exists in a variety of ways for, for artists, but to kind of deal with the, his lineage as a German artist, uh, he incorporated a lot of these um, woodcut. The lights, um, these pieces, everyone knows of all the horrors of history and these particular painters, but when I get to the Louisiana artists, that I want to turn the lights down a little bit, Charles, so that the, the saturation is better. Because, um, if, I don't know if we can lower the house lights a little bit. Now, probably many of you have done plenty of Art History 101 and 
I'm taking you through just kind of a, a personal readdress of disaster. And um, I did so again just to put things in perspective uh, for myself. I was writing a few things about all of this, and I was kind of Katrina-centric, and I happened to put on Hotel Rwanda, and my gosh, um, again, it just puts things in perspective. 700,000 people dead in 100 days. Now, I was here going to the marks, um, even in the concentration camps and in the the gas chambers of the camps. There's scratches and messages all over the walls. I had mentioned earlier, um, kind of end of the war, the war experience and existentialism, but that was out. All right, then there's envir our environment right now. That's a kind of pretty horrific thing. This is a photographer who is not making it really in the fine, fine art circles, but I think he's done some great environmental work. Chris Jordan, um, he did the bottle piece, The Power of Numbers, and he's doing this um, series. He's doing a lot of work on that plastic island that keeps growing out in the Pacific. This is just really sad. Then here's our own bird. These are, uh, so that's a little backdrop. And what I realized going through all of this darkness is that what, what stands out for me about Katrina is not any kind of uniqueness or coastal Louisiana. There's no uniqueness to disasters, I've said five times now. But I think there is a uniqueness to our response in a way. So that's what I'll focus on now is, is the response. I thought there were going to be students here. Uh, I don't know, uh, doesn't look like there are many, but this was just a quick little interlude giving a few examples of some pre-Katrina work and then a few examples of post-Katrina work and then I'm going to focus on my larger art community. This is an early, again, this is an early communication piece using CB radio booths, uh, many of them with a central control tower. It was a big public art piece uh, that I did in, I think, 76, 75, 76. Do a lot of the tables. This was a piece called Feasting with Panthers in 84. Uh, on the, dealing with Oscar Wilde, the 100th anniversary of Oscar Wilde's visit to New Orleans. It's a big project called Soul Shadows, that um, 7,000 foot sprawling installation, but uh, dealing with urban warfare and the crisis um, within the inner cities. Do a lot much. I'm going to move to the post Katrina stuff since there are not many students here. Well, this piece, maybe I'll talk about. Um, this is a piece called The Face of God in Search of that uh, premiered at the 1996 Olympics in Atlanta based on Tennessee Williams' play Suddenly Last Summer. And I think I returned to both that play and some of the issues I was dealing with in this particular piece are reoccurring in, in, in my work. Okay, um, these are some post-Katrina pieces.
This is uh, made with tons of shattered glass called Hurricane Sweet and Nine Movements. This is a piece called Glass Floor. It's uh, built up, uh, obviously, with light underneath it and by day. By night. So this, this study I don't know for um, peers for the city of Mobile called New Peers for Mobile. This is a piece uh, called Swan Songs for a Falling House with Earth and 500 small cypress trees. And it was part of an installation within an entire house. It was, a, it was very interested with all of the houses being ripped apart. So this was a study for a um, project called Rapture House. I guess I didn't think of it at the time, but it must be somewhat indebted to Gordon Vada Clark, who went in and took sections of buildings apart and put them in museums. And he did gorgeous deconstructions. But in this case, it was already there. And so uh, I do like to work with, with light. And so there was the uh, desire to shift some of the parts of these buildings that were getting ready to collapse and accentuate them with light. So it's Rapture Rupture House. This is um, a piece called the Wetland Table. It was a table with water running down the center uh, that ran an entire block. And it was to bring people together um, post-storm and to consider the wetlands and it was also just a ritualistic piece uh, to bring the neighborhood together with people who were visiting, international people who were visiting for Prospect One that was hosted in the city of New Orleans. Uh, it was, I did this kind of Ethiopian style where these big giant um, discs, it's from a tree uh, in my studio, each disc served four people and so um, you would pick food off of the disc and eat with your hands. And this is at night, there was fire coming out of the water shaft. This is a project, a uh, piece called Project Mutants. I've done some prototypes. These are drawings for how I had hoped it would be installed. And they're illuminated kind of orbs that contain um, scientific devices that can monitor contaminants in water. So I have a few of them, and it's just been a, a big effort to try to raise money and interest. I have um, members, serious uh, members of the science community who are partners, but just to get the money and the orchestration, it hasn't happened yet. And I almost want to just put it away in the bottom of the of a box, you know, just, okay, it didn't work, but I think I'm going to stick with it a while. Um, this is in that house piece, uh, it's called um, As I Lay Dying. This house, by the way, just collapsed shortly after I did this, but this was a raised shotgun and dug it out, and dug further in the earth, and thought of Faulkner's piece. This is a um, dirge for journey. So, so many boats and architectural remnants were all over the city and it was just so hard to let them go. And particularly musical instruments, brass instruments. I'd be riding around and there was a busted up trumpet or a flute or trombone. And I just started collecting um, these remnants of instruments. So this piece, I'll show you in another manifestation, but there are, these horn instruments are distributed throughout the boat. And our great, great composer, Terence Blanchard, um, allowed me to work with his score, Dirge. This was Dirge for Journey. He had a piece called Dirge. And it was haunting and wonderful, and so the sound was distributed through the horns in the boat, kind of like this symphony of ghosts. Um, it worked better. It, 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 I showed it in a few different places. This was the least uh, 
um, powerful presentation for the music. Um, but anyway, the mu you get it, you get it. It looked good in that house, but the music, the acoustics weren't right. So this was um, in Dallas. Piece. Then when it was in New Orleans, the piece was robbed, <laughs> which is a fitting in. <laughs> People kept breaking in <laughs> and stealing the musical instruments and the shutters and, and the presenter um, was a, a bit uh, flaky to say the least. And, and then finally you just had to give it up. It was like, okay, you know, the, you do these boats and it was, it was inspired by the Northwest Coast Indians and the Vikings and the, you, put, you put what's dead on the boat and you just send it out and it's over. So I think that <laughs> inadvertently the uh, vandalism on this piece uh, really helped purge me. <laughs> um, this is a, another piece with some black glass called uh, Breach, and it's, of course, the Katrina story. Um, yeah, there was a hurricane, but the big story is the Corps of Engineers, as you all know, and we didn't have strong enough levees. And so this piece is dealing with that. Back to mutants, or where we should be with mutants. That other one was a misplaced slide, I apologize. So um, this is um, in the marsh. This is a close-up. I actually installed some uh, in Earth for, um, there was a meeting, anthropologists were having a big conference and they asked me to speak. I had more people there, but you guys are really nice. But, um, <laughs> anyway, uh, I also showed some of the uh, mutants and there was no water around this exhibition site. So I said, well, I'll just put them in the earth. I'm so glad I did because after a few weeks, they became kind of life <laughs> they, they were colonies. What are they made uh, of? Huh? What are they made out of, Don? This is, um, it's an a acrylic, formed acrylic. They're, they're organic. Uh, these are the prototypes, and they're not as melted down or uh, amoeba-like as I'd like, but that's the idea. floating down the river. I won't, I'm not going to get into the minutia of this project. It's very complicated, but these are some conceptual uh, studies that they, just in a nutshell, they're stationary. They're stationary installations. And then at a certain point, they form kind of this flotilla. Um, and the idea is, is that we don't need to talk about pollution in the river here in the state of Louisiana because most of our pollution comes from other states. Let's talk about Iowa. You know, 27% of all the runoff in the Mississippi comes from these nice farmers in Iowa. So the project was maybe if we put some of the mutants in Iowa and they float down, maybe we have this kind of civic engagement and we uh, kind of buy state uh, dialogue and maybe that's a nicer way to say do unto others as you would have others do unto you. It gives some type of visual illustration. Um, also thought that the novelty of these mutants um, on the banks of all of these rivers, it just stirs up the conversation. And so I was hoping that it could be used as a uh, kind of stimulant for education, environmental education. You see how things started to grow in there? I just loved it. Okay. Um, I did these, uh, because neighborhoods were really wiped out, you had only thing that would re remain, let's talk about uh, in New Orleans and neighborhoods like Lakeview or the Lower Ninth Ward and even in Gentilly, parts of Gentilly. You don't know those neighborhoods, but they should be noted, so I did so since you're recording this. Um, houses were completely gone, but these concrete stoops that have been so kind of symbolic for the life, the culture in New Orleans, particularly pre-TV, people were, at the end of the day, always sitting out on their stoops. And this is how 
news traveled and it was, you know, it was just something you'd see riding through the city. Everybody was out on the steps, especially, think, pre-air conditioning and pre-TV. <laughs> so here's um, Katrina and you ride around and the houses are all gone and the, the steps are there and then the weeds are starting to grow up and then in some of the neighborhoods a year, a year later, the, the it, 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 nature is taking over. It's almost a reforestation. So then it had the look of a great, you know, like they were tombstones. So I decided to do illuminated steps, um, illuminated so that it would be markers for loss, but also to keep the light there. Like this is the way home, these little lighthouses. Um, and produced a few of them and placed them throughout uh, New Orleans, particularly in some of the neighborhoods afflicted, and then also in neighborhoods that were not, and in affluent neighborhoods to remind that part of our community that we still have a lot of work to do to rebuild our city and bring back all of the population. So they were distributed that way. Then Martha, Texas, uh, uh, Ball, I don't know if anybody knows Ballroom Martha, it's a great, great organization, um, good small community, but big on arts. Of course, Donald Judd bought half the town. And so anyway, they called me and said, we'd like you to install the steps out there. And I just loved it because it took it out, which is what I'm trying to do here, took it out of the very specific about uh, New Orleans and Katrina and dealt with what was universal. Uh, about our homes, our caves, and about loss, how we're just passing through. And it was not far from an Indian site, uh, a significant Indian site. So I like that these steps all of a sudden were just out in the big landscape. And we put some out also. Um, this was an installation of them uh, in the meadow at the New Orleans Museum of Art. This, I'm trying to get them, you know, I'm greedy, very greedy. I'm trying to get them to bring me back to do the stairway to heaven. <laughs> so this is a study for Marfa. Um, okay, we have an oil spill also. And that was frightening. I mean, it turned out that, you know, a lot of the oil, they say, is the heat did away with it. But boy, when that happened, I, I took that oil spill worse than Katrina for some reason. Well, I know why I did, but I did. Um, and so I had an exhibition uh, 2011, March 2011. That was a lot of work that was responsive in some way to the spill. And, you know, there was all this talk, well, it's, it's uh, the heat's so great, we're not going to be like Alaska, it's just going to dissipate, and there's nothing in the water, and don't worry about the dispersants, and, don't worry about the dead zone, and don't worry about this. And um, I ended up doing a um, series of portraits of an 18-member family, and uh, put their portraits all in kind of water. And so um, I don't have good photographs of this, unfortunately, but this um, is called Test Tubes. And there was an installation with all 18, so you'll just see a few of them out of context. This was the exhibition of the scene. I'm sorry, this slide looks distorted. Um, so I dealt with some of the uh, symbols of the uh, industrial complex. Um, and of course, I was, I, I have my dear friend, uh, dear friends, plural, Kent and Charlie Davis, sitting up in the top there. Thanks for coming. You really added to the numbers here tonight. Uh, but I called Kent Davis up. She's a girl. She's the wife. And I said, Kent, the oysters, they're closing down the oyster beds. And it just seemed horrible. And she and I both love oysters. Charlie, I think, was in the country. And so Kent and I ran out to get our last <laughs> plate of oysters at the St. Bernard Oyster Festival. So, uh, and I started thinking the oyster, everybody loves them so much, and that this was more than a food. It, it was some kind of cultural um, icon. 
So I did, I started casting these uh, cubes, oyster shell cubes. And uh, this is an oyster shell altar table that I um, actually did not make, but it's, I'm still throwing it. Uh, this was in the show. This show, was, it doesn't look like one artist did it, I know that. I'm pretty much a conceptual artist and I choose a media uh, to best respond to whatever idea I have. So that's why it looks like so many different artists, but it's all me. And these are two sculptures. One is um, St. Francis and Friends, and the other is, I think, a stronger piece, which is uh, the explorer Tony. It was after, what's Tony's last name? BP Tony? Uh, uh, Hay Hayward? Hayward. Hayward. So he was so, he was kind of so silly, right? Uh, so this was Tony, the, a piece that he inspired. And also, um, who did that movie? Who's that great film director? Um, he did that film of the conquistadors going through South America and they end up all dying coming out of the um, Hirsch, Hirsch, uh, Warner Herzog. Herzog. What's Herzog? His? Yeah. Warner Herzog? Yeah. So that film, I don't know if you, what's the name of the film? Do you the remember? Mission? Huh? Is it The Mission? No, it's not The Mission. That's a great film, but it's not The Mission. Um, if you ever have me back, I'll bring the clip, the film. It's great. Um, water. I, these are some pieces where I'm trying to create the surface of water. Um, and put them where you look down upon them, but this one is leaning against a wall. And I wanted, I, that was a prototype, that was actually me starting to work with materials because I had a, uh, a project where I wanted to have a sheet with water coming out of it. So I was working around with um, uh, this material to um, try to make a sheet for a water, for a water fountain. Um, these are some pieces called water markers, uh, and they are photo and acrylic combo pieces on highly polished slabs of acrylic. They're a little thicker than what it looks like here, um, but it marks it, it, they mark the floodwaters at various heights. Because you go into, I always try to think, okay, I'm doing this work, but how do I connect? Uh, with my neighborhood, and I'd go into the grocery, and Miss Mary was saying, the water, my niece, it was over eight feet. Somebody else, well, we, it wasn't so bad, we only had four. And so there was this kind of uh, conversation, and so these pieces are all titled in the uh, colloquial. This is a piece of my studio, it shows you a little bit more of the thickness on the work. Um, this is a water wall. I'm, I'm moving in this direction right now. This, these kind of translucent uh, water wall pieces. Some ladders. I'm tired of myself, so I am going to... There's a little bit more of me, and then we're going to have the best part of the night, okay, which is my colleagues. Um, all of this uh, activity, right, the storms, we've got uh, Katrina, then the oil spill, and then there's the tsunami, and then one morning I wake up and it, poor Haiti didn't get hit again. I mean, that was just, that did it. That just did it. And I was on the fence about whether or not I was going to uh, do this piece uh, about the goddess Fortuna. Um, you all know the medieval goddess Fortuna. She was, uh, if not, allow me, she was popularized by a late 4th century uh, philosopher, Boethius, who wrote The Constellation of Philosophy. And that was the most widely read book up until the time of Shakespeare. And in this book, he has dialogue. He is falsely imprisoned. The Romans uh, suspect, this is true, the Romans suspect uh, Boethius of being uh, soft on the Christians. So he gets arrested and found, he was an aristocrat, uh, he was a statesman, a learned man, and public servant, and he did everything right, and he had a nice family, his kids were good, and boom, 
this is the way my life is going to end. I'm in prison. I'm going to be executed. Um, and so he starts this book while incarcerated, uh, The Consolation of Philosophy. And it is this dialogue with the angel, Roman Greco goddess Fortuna. And it goes through, uh, and she instructs him. They, they said, why me, why me? And she says, well, not you, it's somebody else. But this was an, uh, um, a great line. And if you will allow me, one's virtue is all that one truly has, because it is not imperiled by the vicissitudes of fortune. So each day you wake up and something can happen. So it's not that it will or won't happen, it's how you handle it. It's how you handle it. And uh, so I did a piece about this, um, and it was Boethius, but also a long-term interest I had in a book, Confederacy of Dunces, by John Kennedy Toole. John Kennedy Toole turns to Boethius for his own book, and he has his protagonist, Ignatius Riley, kind of fashioned after Boethius, and Ignatius Riley will go into his bedroom, close the door, talk to the goddess Fortuna about his uh, life, and then um, also relieve himself uh, and, and, uh, for obtaining uh, physiological mysticism is the way I call his masturbation episodes. Okay, so um, goddess Fortuna, both from the fact that it was in Confederacy of Dunces and that I had this interest in it and that I think that, well, if I use the goddess Fortuna and Confederacy of Dunces, maybe that's such a popular book in New Orleans and maybe that's a way, the public artist in me, maybe that's a, a good way to deal with some of this complexity. Maybe I should unravel uh, a deeper meaning in a Confederacy of Dunces and um, so I did, and it was a two-year undertaking, and the only relevance to tonight is that uh, with all of the stuff I've shown you, I, I really <laughs> did, I do think this is the wisest thing I've come across, <laughs> this, this line by Boethius. But I'll show you a little bit of the mayhem of the goddess Fortuna. Um, I did this uh, just this past year as part of Prospect 2, which is the International Art Biennial stage in New Orleans. I was the home girl, and I had uh, good real estate. I had the oldest uh, courtyard building, one of the oldest buildings in the city, owned now by the historic New Orleans collection, called the Brulatour Mansion and Courtyard. And uh, I'll show you a few pictures of that, because I'm going to end my own personal work uh, about disaster and turbulence. Uh, I just turned it over to Fortuna. Okay. Um, I did, which um, through special effects and did media and ricochets of, uh, through windows, I created a life-size ghost of, of the goddess Fortuna who danced over Ignatius Riley's wet bed fountain in the center of the courtyard. In the end, I decided not to go very contemporary with that sheet because when I looked through the carriageway and thought of people passing on the street, I said maybe I will lure them in with kind of an overture to history. So um, a, a very, um, Keith Sonier, who some of you may know, who's a Louisiana artist, uh, very important of course in art history, uh, contemporary art history, he came and he says you should not have put that carriage bed in there. Why didn't you stick to your sheet? And put and so, um, anyway, it's always a battle of the public art and the, um, so anyway, for the good, the bad, or the ugly, I went with the carriage bed. Okay, we'll continue. It was a three-story building in the round, a square. I had dunces, um, uh, 66 of them, life-size on balconies and in windows. And the dunces, um, of course, uh, came from, I don't know if you know this, but Jonathan Swift said, you will know when a genius appears in the world, or you will, this is paraphrased, because my cadence is all, or the words are all. You will know when a genius appears in the world, or you will be surrounded in a confederacy of dunces. 
So that comes from Swift, but of course I think John Kennedy too definitely was doing kind of a double play on this and also dealing with the Confederacy of the South. So these dunces uh, do uh, hark to the medieval motif, but then their look is a touch menacing and I, I wanted it to go from the medieval monk to the Mardi Gras reveler to the Ku Klux Klan and to who knows what, all the good, the bad, and the ugly in us. So um, that's why they're the way they are. The piece uh, was heavy, heavy, uh, heavily layered in sound. So you, you're not getting that tonight. But uh, this was the goddess Fortuna's chamber. And I projected into this room, this was an eight foot circle di uh, diameter. And, the goddess was projected there and kind of ricocheted into the courtyard as a ghost. These are still frames. Um, the goddess Fortuna here, is, instead of turning a wheel of fortune, she, uh, I cast to play the goddess Fortuna uh, a, what we call, I don't know if you're familiar with the music genre bounce, uh, and it's a subcategory of bounce, which is called sissy bounce. And um, I cast the, one of the, the, the most important uh, factors of Sissy Bounce, uh, Katie Red, and then uh, also worked with her, uh, associate, her friend, Big Frida. I don't know if you know Big Frida either. Big Frida is another Sissy Bounce artist who came after Katie Red and is now more famous than Katie Red, but there's no ego there. They're still good friends, and they both worked with me on this project. So why did I turn to uh, a sissy bounce artist to play this important historic role of, of the goddess Fortuna? I said, well, the goddess Fortuna uh, is really an oracle of sorts. And, and oracles, like you, you have the Dalai Lama uh, has an oracle, and you've got, um, who else was I thinking of? Um, oh, Kuma, Sybil. Accounts of these uh, oracles, they shake a lot to get into that transcendental state. And here I'm in a music town with sound and dance, and so I said, well, I like the idea of, of reaching the transcendental state through this kind of performance art. And who shakes best in this time and place in New Orleans? Well, Katie Red and Big Frida. So I got the idea to cast them, and again, I said, gosh, Eureka, this is great, because that also would allow me to bring in a whole other um, audience into the piece. And if I can do audience building without compromising the aesthetic, I will do it time and time again. And so that's what happened, and I think that was a good call, and it just brought us all a lot of joy to work with these two artists. And um, then I... Failed to mention, I think I, I in the, the reason I was so versed in Confederacy of Dunces is in 1991, I did the first stage, uh, first and only up until a couple of years ago, stage rendering of Confederacy of Dunces with an English director who had come over to start Swine Palace Theater for LSU, uh, an equity theater. He's now moved on, but I ended up doing four productions with him, and the very first production I did was Confederacy of Dunces, and I spent months and months, that's where I learned of Boethius, and I ended up doing a medieval set, but with contemporary raucous costumes. And so anyway, in one room in this big uh, exhibition, we showed uh, some of my early costume drawings, and a few of the costumes were built. And this area of the exhibition was kind of in a room I called the House of Joy. So I don't know if you're versed in the book, but you, if you are, you know the House of Joy is a special place. Uh, this was the Confederacy Room of the South. The, the courtyard itself dealt with the medieval uh, history that I was trying to um, overture, and this dealt with the Confederacy of the South, and I had some motifs in here, Jones's Black Love, Robert and Lee's Boots, and a whole series of one mask that I manipulated digitally, you know, kind of to reflect the great pantheon of mankind. 
We had uh, wheels of misfortune up in ceilings that you could see from. Okay, uh, and here are just a few stills of the goddess Fortuna in different costume moments. Uh, and these are her wheelette, the, the girls who spent, spent the wheel of fortune too. They were in different windows. This will give you a sense of some of the costume. Okay. Where is the Louisiana stuff? Is that it? Okay. I happen to think, do you think that's it on that disc? Did it stop? Or because I put everything on one. Yeah, that was the end of the slideshow. Huh? That was the end. Okay. Yeah. Okay, it's your call. Since I have a lot of work uh, talking about the work of other Louisiana artists, uh, I can probably do that in 20 minutes. I can go get another disc, which is 10 minutes away, uh, or we can just end it with this, but I did want to show you, I've got, I did tons of work. Um, uh, it's your call. We, I guess we'll save it for another time. But I'll tell you about it. Is that right? We're not going to let me go get a disc. You want to go have a cocktail or something like that? What a shame. You know, when I was leaving, I looked at my computer, which was quite fatigued. I said, I wonder if I should go. I said, no, I can't. Okay. Okay. Do you want a chair, though? Huh? Do you want a chair? Take like a chair. Do I want a chair? Okay. No. This is the only exercise I'm getting today. <laughs> All right. I just feel terrible because I wanted to show you all of this great art of Louisiana. But um, it'll be online. How's that? I'll, I'll give you the, uh, the text, a little introduction to the project. And as soon as it's posted online, we'll send, uh, send you the link. And you can, all right. Uh, it came out of thinking about all of this turbulence and uh, how Louisiana responded uniquely, I thought, to it, and started looking more and more, not only at how my work may have shifted, but what happened with some of my colleagues. And I think I realized, this, well, there's a little bit of a shift, but it's, it's unified, I thought, by our um, multiculturalism. It was, it was impacted by that. Let me just read this. Okay. Um, Historically, native Louisiana Indians, Cajuns, and Creoles turned to their own faith-based healers, also known as traiteurs, to help cure the ails of the body. Okay? Today, with advances in science and access to Western medicine, the traiteurs are near extinct. Here, science has triumphed, but on the other hand, it has failed to remedy coastal Louisiana's festering ecological oncologies that erode both our land and our way of life. This leaves abundant purpose for a subfield of traiteurs, the cultural traiteurs, a category of artists who are actively producing creative interventions to foretell, to forestall, and to compassionately mediate our collective malaise in the late Louisiana period, belonging to the 21st century of washing away. So um, the exhibition I'm working on is called From the Eyes of Traiteurs, Art Practice in Late Louisiana. Um, realms of Reality, when I, From the Eyes of Traiteurs distinguishes dominant uh, coastal Louisiana art from production elsewhere by identifying its historical recognition of dual or multi-dimensional realities and its adherence to the shamanistic functions of art revealed in, 
and then I'm listing a, a many, many artists. I want to go get that desk. I just feel terrible about that. All right. The artists, I'll read this and we'll just have to leave it at that. Um, and it's, okay, I list, I wanted to start this with the uh, aboriginal compositions of Clarence John Laughlin. He was an important segue for me between the historic, historical stuff that we looked at earlier, particularly coming out of World War, going into Dadaism and Surrealism, which was uh, a response to the war and all the nihilism. So Clarence Laughlin embraces, he reads uh, the, the symbolists, the French symbolists. He uh, is very influenced by uh, Max Ernst, and there was a book, some guy, which, does anybody remember Max Ernst's um, important book that influenced a lot of the uh, surrealists? Okay, so Clarence read that. Um, Clarence is uh, born in Lake Charles and moves to New Orleans, but lost his father at the age of 13. And at that time, um, he also lost his faith. Because his father died at the, uh, the, the flu of 1918. And Clarence was 13 at the time. And he was praying for his father to survive this. And his father died. And it caused a crisis of faith for Clarence that he said he never got over. However, you look at his work, and it's loaded with um, kind of uh, evidence of his belief in duality and multi dimensions. And we even have his big body of work uh, that he himself will call the third world of photography, the transcendence of the object. Um, it's uh, and then. Um, he, he still denies his faith, but he's, he, there's a quote. He says that the Catholic Church, he turns back, somebody was interviewing him, and he, he says something about the Catholic Church. He said, I'm not a practitioner, I'm not a believer, but, um, but to the effect that they're the, the greatest masters of theater and that, that they've done such a great service for us all because they keep this belief in multi-realms alive. And so he believed in that, but not all of their other structure. So you've got this um, belief structure in Clarence, and you've got voodoo in New Orleans. So you've got the Catholic thing, you've got the Indians. And um, I think that there is a, a great um, prevalence in uh, belief in spirit world or multi-dimensions. So that's what I was looking at picking that common denominator uh, through a lineage of artists. It's not the only style of art being practiced there, but I think it, uh, it is a dominant style and something I wanted to focus on. So I had Clarence, who I just discussed, and uh, the premonitions, the soul-saving premonitions of Sister Gertrude Morgan, uh, the archetype symbols of David Butler's collective subconscious. Now, Butler, you know, he really is kind of coming out of this Jungian dream. Um, and by the way, Clarence uh, differed from Surrealist in this regard. Surrealist didn't care about connecting the dots, really. They didn't care about going for the meaning. Clarence kept digging and digging and digging for the meaning. And I think he was more of a Jungian than a surrealist in a way. And um, so, anyway, I just wanted to connect that with David Butler. Uh, the geopsychic deconstructions of the ordinary view by photographer and critic Eric Bookhart, who's based in New Orleans. I don't know that many of you know of Eric. He writes for uh, regional art journals. He's a good writer. And he did this book called Geopsychic Wonders. And it, it's photographs a book of photographs with text by another uh, eccentric in New Orleans, John Newland, a guy by the name of John Newland. And there again, it's very much out of the Laughlin School where they're taking one thing and saying, well, it's not really this. There is this other layer of meaning, this duality. So Eric is uh, a good person in the mix here because um, some of the artists are, are self-taught, and Eric happens to be uh, very learned, and, but yet they're all right there in the same swimming pool. 
um, dealing with the, with the same approach. Uh, and then I have the shamanistic uh, rituals of the Mardi Gras Indians with, uh, of course, Tutti Montana. And what you're missing now are some gorgeous pictures by all these artists, but Tutti Montana, uh, and then his son, who's now taken over, uh, Daryl Montana, but I think of great note is an artist, uh, Mardi Gras Indian chief by the name of Victor Harris, who is doing, um, he's doing some amazing fusion work. He's taking the Plains Indians and the Mardi Gras Indian look that we know of, inherited by the likes of uh, Tutti Montana, but he's going back, his stuff is kind of tribal, it's going back more uh, into a, an African fusion more than the Northwest Indian. It, it's very interesting. And he's very uh, important right now because he's keeping uh, the ritual of Mardi Gras Indians alive, not just in this superficial way when you read about it, oh, let's put on a costume and dance. I think he's really um, extraordinary in that he's, he's dealing with uh, shamanistic customs. I do see him kind of shamanistic. Um, then we've got uh, Claude Cannell, who's from this neck of the woods here, who just got it by way of osmosis, didn't she? I mean, my goodness, just beautiful work and very um, drawing from the land. I'm, uh, I have two other dear friends. I have wonderful friends, by the way, who came up from New Orleans, Scott Simmons and John Abasian, and we're, they're taking me to Clyde's this weekend, the former Clyde house. I know it's, being, it's been dismantled, but I'm gonna go out and see where the Swamp Songs were scored. <laughs> and um, really looking forward to that. And what an amazing artist. And I think that she, oh, I thought you were raising your hand. I was hoping so, yeah, okay. Um, then there's, it, this is a regret, because I don't know that you know of uh, Tina Gerard's early work. She's based in Lafayette, but she left uh, in the late 60s, or may, I don't know when she hit New York, but she and her husband, Dickie Landry, who's a, avant-garde saxophone player. They went to New York and just kind of hit the city and brought all the mumbo jumbo and the gumbo and, and, and kind of ritualistic art. Tina went all over the world doing these uh, ritualistic uh, projects with uh, half between theater and half visual arts with multicolored fabric, but, and, kind of Gregory of sorts, but it's very, very Louisiana, and when she got to New York, this, she just brought Louisiana to New York, and just the timing was right. So, um, I had examples, uh, you'll see them online, of a lot of her early uh, ritual work, which is, you know, really uh, shamanista, and interesting. Um, I will say this, Tina, I appreciate her work, and, but there was a long period of time I just couldn't appreciate her personally because she was so intense. And now I, uh, everything's all together, and um, I do want to acknowledge her and say what great work she's done. And talk to her today, and she sends her best. And if students were here, I'd have you really look into her early work. All right, uh, I had here Tina Gerard, who distributed the Louisiana Kool-Aid of multi-sensory mysticism worldwide. Uh, then I had the Fantasia Vistas of Douglas Bourgeois, where only robots and dogs can survive. Now, Douglas Bourgeois, everybody knows Douglas's work, probably. He's, he's one of our better known Louisiana living artists. Douglas's work has changed a bit post-Katrina, I mean, um, it's uh, really uh, an absence of, of people, and there are the robots and the astronauts, and um, then there, were, there was a series in his last show. He does have figures, but they're all in silhouette, the fallen angel, and, and so there is a, uh, I think Douglas is going through a little bit of a shift, um, and so is the artist Willie Birch. I don't know if you know Willie Birch, I put him in this mix 
his, his post-Katrina works, he was always a guy on the street documenting, uh, doing drawings of um, people who was an African-American artist and very active in the civil rights movement and community building. And he was out there drawing, on the, drawing from the street. And then after Katrina, he's been in his backyard. I mean, I have some beautiful, I think the best drawing he's ever done, you know, a little chicken, but it's just blades of grass. It's almost like he's saying, well, I did all I could on the street, and I, you know, with everything going on, I just, I, I just, I give up. I'm just going to go in my yard and pray. <laughs> and there, there are, I think, some of his strongest pieces, and I told him, I said, you, I said, Willie, you are free at last <laughs> because you've been doing such public service uh, through your work. Um, and um, anyway, I'm, I'm happy for him with these, this series of drawings. Um, Debbie Fleming Caffrey, everybody is familiar perhaps, I think, with her photography. Um, there you see, I mean, she's, she's another odd bird in the mix, if you know Debbie. Um, but she's going she's looking at it when she in her photograph she's looking for something other than what's just there and I have these smoke filled skies her photographs are very dark with with uh, shafts of light or smoke that are, are extremely dramatic and, and somewhat mystical and then she also not like Sally Mann who will photograph her children Debbie hasn't done that she really um, photographed throughout South Louisiana. She did an important series of a, a woman, Polly, who some people thought was a little off, but Debbie thought she was just so spirit-filled. And these portraits of Polly are riveting. And then she did a series in Mexico. And again, she, she's pursuing kind of the, the, the oracle in a way. So I have her in this. Um, then I have uh, the Elizabeth Shannon I had put in this category. She's got work, uh, I call her the undertaker. <laughs> Elizabeth works with a lot of taxidermy and bones. And, uh, when I talked to her this past week, I told her I'd change my will. Instead of leaving my body to science, I'm going to leave it to her. <laughs> and she'll do something with it. But I think she um, is, uh, I like her. The early work it's with this kind of dust, this patina that is so thick, and um, she also studied philosophy, and uh, you can see that. And anyway, um, she's an interesting gal, and her work is, I think, pursues kind of that duality. And moving along. Oh. David Bates is an artist who is really a child of the Texas Gulf Coast more than Louisiana Gulf Coast, but he spends a lot of time right in that on the state line there. And uh, I thought that I think Bates has an, a way of capturing some kind of pathos, and so um, his his portraits uh, of people post Katrina are pretty uh, extraordinary. I think. I've got in here uh, Luis Cruz Azateta, who I wanted to show you. He's done, he's originally from Cuba and left, of course, in the, uh, and came and took, uh, from, first went to New York and then adopted New Orleans and brought with him uh, his great talent and also a fierce kind of sense of political justice uh, for human rights. And so he's done pieces that are particularly um, uh, address the oil spill and and, and big business and uh, kind of class, kind of where we are right now uh, in a post race more in a, a, a class class crisis. So um, I think he's taking that on. Then I've got uh, Michelle Barisco has she's doing documentary work of she the vanishing landmass the oil spill. She's done some, you know, it's documentary work, but it's, it keeps, it's getting more and more um, poetic. I mean, it's still documentary work, but she's shooting aerials. The compositions are, are pretty striking. 
I don't know that she belongs in this category, but I, I put her in here because I think the works themselves, those objects, these photographs, they got, they're land relics. They're kind of these little <laughs> slivers of land, all that left in um, many areas, just little slivers. And so I had her. I've got a, a young artist, uh, Courtney Egan, does some interesting uh, video works of uh, artificial electronic plants. David Sullivan, who does these industrial animation landscapes that are extraordinary. Dave Greg Graber, who is, I think, just great, great young artist doing media works, media sculpture works, and just very innovative. He's, I think he's the most cutting edge, kind of breakthrough guy right now in Louisiana art. Um, and he, it is a kind of techno shaman. Uh, so he really, you know, I connect him to all of these other artists uh, that I mentioned at the very beginning. Then we've got this, uh, these, uh, it's called uh, Generic Art Solution Gas. These two guys who are screened, Matt Viss and Tony Campbell. And you may have seen some of their works. Uh, but I chose different works to show here. I, I realized that they were doing a lot about sacrifice, the sacrifice of Isaac, David and Goliath. And so I was very interested in this, um, in how they were portrayed. They put themselves in the photographs. Uh, and I was interested in this uh, preoccupation they had with um, sacrifice. And I then would lead you. There are others here, but without visuals, we're going to wrap it up. But to put the final here and now uh, continuation of this kind of mythological, shamanistic, dual reality kind of trajectory, I want to bring you to Beasts of the Southern Wild, the film that just came out. That is. Wow, it's like big news all around the world. But it is oozing. I mean, it's it's so quintessential to um, to the core. I think of a lot of uh, of Louisiana symbolism and mysticism and, and myth itself. These uh, it's a brother Ben um, Zedlin. Has anyone have you all seen the film yet? I highly recommend it, and I even more so recommend a short film that preceded it called Glory at Sea, half an hour film that is breathtakingly beautiful. And um, I think that they're just bringing all of, bringing so much to the screen that, all right, enough with the adjectives, but here, here's the last thing I'll, I want to share with you. I said, how are they doing this? They're, you know, from Brooklyn. They came to New Orleans. There's this big movement. People, were, young artists from all over the place are moving to New Orleans. Young writers, young professionals, urban planners. So this brother and sister team moved to New Orleans. They've been there for seven years. And I said, how did they get this so fast? And it turns out that both of their parents are um, scholars of myth. They grew up with, <laughs> on myth, and they gravitated to Louisiana because it is rich and alive and feeds their continuing interest in myth. So I think that um, this film is, is a great celebration of, of our culture, and um, it shows the work of two really remarkable uh, great, great young artist. Um, sorry you're not seeing the visuals. I did my best to sing their glories. And uh, thank you for having me.